our native land, our native land, our native, our native, our native land. Hoya, hoya, our native. Hey everybody, Chad Asleel here, host of Our Native Land through Czech Podcast Studios in Victoria, British Columbia. Thank you so much for joining me. I'm super excited to talk to my next guest and introduce you to her. But before we do so, I just want to do a territory acknowledgement. I acknowledge with respect the Lekwungen peoples on whose traditional territory Czech Studio stands upon and to all the tribes that are upon the new channel, Kwakwakwak and Coast Salish, on Vancouver Island. I thank these nations and traditional land keepers for allowing me to live, work, and play on their land. So thank you so much. And thank you, the listener and viewer, for tuning in to another episode of Our Native Land. My guest today is currently the NDP Member of Parliament uh, for Nunavut. Her name is Mumilak Kakak. She is uh, one of the first and only Inuk people ever to be uh, elected into the House of Commons. And uh, she's here today uh, to talk about uh, her career. Uh, you know, she made a recent announcement about uh, not seeking re-election. We're going to talk about that as well, too. So, Mumilak, thank you so much for taking time out of your busy schedule uh, to talk to me. Thank you for the time and space and for having me, Matna. Absolutely. So I will talk about the speech. That's it, It's quite significant, obviously, but I, I want to get to know you a bit more. Um, you know, you're, you're quite quite a young, uh, one of the younger women or men to ever be elected into uh, the House of Commons. So maybe take me back to uh, uh, a young Mumalak who's thinking about uh, running as a member of parliament. Tell me sort of how you got started and, and what it took to get there. Yes, yeah, so uh, I'm currently 27 years old. Uh, at the time that I, I was elected, I was 25 years old. And it wasn't a thought in my mind uh, in terms of running for member of parliament until uh, August of 2019. So a few short weeks before uh, the writ dropped and even that might be uh, quite not quite a few days, but definitely not quite a few weeks uh, somewhere in between. And um, up until then, I would have definitely laughed in your face uh, when it came to a conversation around running for any political position. Um, the conversation started as, if you want my opinion about Justin Trudeau, you're talking to the wrong person. I have no interest, space or time for that. Yeah. And the individual is like, well, that's not what it's about. And I said, well, it doesn't hurt to have a conversation. And by the end of that conversation, I said, hold on, let me get this straight. You're asking if I would be interested for running for member of parliament for Nunavut NDP. Mm -hmm. And uh, within a couple of days after um, very much in-depth research and in, into the leader, because I wasn't going to run for somebody I didn't believe in mm -hmm. and uh, long conversations with my mom, I decided it was something, it was the best opportunity to try and help as many people as I could at the time. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's really the only thing I saw it as and just went in with the idea that all I can do is my best. I have nothing to lose and um, really hit the ground running. Yeah, absolutely. And obviously it came out to be a success. So at no point you growing up, like you said, you'd laugh in my face, but like there was there was no kind of political drive before this moment. It was just it just felt like the right thing at the right time. Is that correct? Yeah, but I also had have the view that as an indigenous person, our lives are affected uh, in every way, shape and form from the moment we're born by federal and institutional policy and, and procedure. So I, I would also argue that my whole life is political uh, because politics is really what determines the outcome um, for Indigenous peoples, uh, right to self-determination, right to opportunity and um, among many other things. Absolutely. So you get elected. Uh, you're now a member of parliament. You're, you know, going back and forth between Nunavut and Ottawa. Um, tell me a bit about the, like, because to be a member of parliament for Nunavut or for a northern territory, you're covering a larger territory in regards to land base than, say, like a member of parliament here in B.C. where, you know, they might have, um, you know, an area like the size of your thumb if you're looking at a map compared to Nunavut. So tell me what it's like to cover such a vast a territory within one riding. Yeah, and I and I think that's something I I didn't really realize at first until those uh, the the media bites were coming out about 
uh, the youngest to be elected within the territory and the largest electoral riding in the world. Um, so not just necessarily here in Canada, but in the world. And I've always said and had a view that eventually uh, Canada and the rest of the world will start turning to northern countries. Uh, that's where the fresh air and water is, and that's where all the ice is going to be melting. And if humans don't take a turn and start taking care of the environment, we're going to be scrambling for very basic resources, and the earth is going to be scrambling for those things as well. Eventually, everybody will be turning to the north. and to represent uh, that vast um, of uh, a piece of land, I think is is something that needs to be looked at a lot more and is not heavily considered uh, within the Canadian institution right now. And it definitely very much so needs to be a lot more because that's where we're going to be turning eventually. Absolutely. And I, again, I didn't know much about your personal platform or the NDP platform when it comes to, to climate change and the environment in the North. But what were what are the, some of the things in your mind? OK, now I'm in office. Uh, what can, you know? What do you want to do to help uh, the environment and the climate change within the North? There's a number of things that we see continuously happen, especially for Indigenous peoples within Canada. How we hear the line where Indigenous peoples are included within the process, but when you actually look up at what that means, it probably means a checklist on a questionnaire that they might have talked to five people who agreed meanwhile there were 50 people who didn't agree with whatever they may have been doing mm -hmm. um so to me it's about inuit having meaningful space at the table at that decision making table um, but also way before that during the process what is being done within uh within the territory uh, around communities that are going to be affecting hunters that are going to be affecting gathering grounds that are going to be affecting animal migration routes that are vital to our culture that are vital to our way of be being and always have been um, for example i've been uh, working on having there is a mine company in the Baffin region uh, or the Qaytaluk region right now who haven't been consulting Inuit, have not been transparent, have not been upholding their responsibilities in those ways. And we've seen Inuit actually protest against and speak out against uh, phase two of this particular mine. So I've done uh, my best to be able to uh, keep those lines of communication open so everybody Everybody has an understanding of what people are looking for and expecting, especially Inuit, of course, those that I, I represent within the constituency are uh, those that are my primary uh, primary goal to, to ensure that their voices are heard. Absolutely. And you talk about, you know, having your voice heard, and that kind of ties into a bit about your speech and part of the reason, um, could be maybe part of the reason why uh, you're not seeking re-election. So you, you've been quoted in, in a portion of the speech saying people like me don't belong here in the federal institution. So tell me when that feeling first started. Was the, it right from the was it, like, yeah was it right, right from, from what, right the from the beginning flight, right from the beginning right from the spot off and I, I've thought a lot about this and and how to explain it and what that means yeah. and because what it what it means and what the words we des decide to use, uh, especially when people like to say how, how shocking it is, mm -hmm. it's shocking for primarily white people. It's mm -hmm. shocking for those that aren't a part of a, uh, aren't visibly um, part of a minority. It's a national example, if you will, of things that happen to Indigenous people, uh, racial, visible minorities every single day, mm -hmm. whether it's going to a store, whether it's trying to maybe access a loan, all these barriers just constantly because of how we look or speak or where we come from. Um, and that it wasn't shocking to Indigenous people. It wasn't mm -hmm. shocking to to other racialized individuals. It was shocking to to white people, mm -hmm. and I think that that and and the comments even that have come out since then from Mark Milner, who said this was something that a previous member of Parliament experienced. They clearly know it's 
been happening and has happened. Mm -hmm. And for me, it was, uh, why would I expect anything different when I experienced this and Indigenous people across the country experienced this on a micro level day in, day out? Mm -hmm. Um, it didn't even particularly cross my mind to act or behave any differently because I wouldn't expect anything mm -hmm. different. There was though one, one time, um, I felt like it was my space and, um, thankfully she, she texted me after I did that speech, but Jody Wilson Raybould, mm -hmm. um, had, um, I went to her swearing in ceremony. Mm -hmm. And that definitely didn't feel like a colonial space. It was mm. everybody was in their regalia, in their traditional wear, and it just it had a completely different energy and completely different feel. And that that one time for that like half hour um, was definitely a very comfortable space. But other than that, uh, it was it definitely wasn't. Uh, but that's a experience that Indigenous people experience all all the time every single day absolutely and how beautiful would it be if that moment that half hour moment could be replicated more often i mean it's not like it it, it doesn't feel like it's that difficult to make the safe space and comfortable for indigenous people or anybody of color but first it's unfortunate that the conversation is boiled down to well there's this maybe this one time and i think that's maybe part of part of the reasoning of of why you did the speech that you did. Um, so to, let's put it in this scenario. You also was quoted in saying, you know, there's times, you know, that you were, you know, somewhat chased and, and almost had your hands, uh, people put your hands on you, like trying to stop you in the hallway uh, that you weren't recognized as a member of parliament. Um, you know, you've had to have like little pep talks in the elevator, uh, you know, or little pep talks in the mirror. So let, let's say you're looking into the mirror and I, I'm beside you and, and I see that you're, you're trying to pep talk yourself. So what's what's going through your head? What kind of emotions do you have to tell yourself before you walk into that house? Um, so there's a number of things I usually do when I'm walking into a building on Parliament. First, I always try and approach um, the security straight on. I never try and take like a set of stairs that might be off a little bit off to the side. Mm -hmm. um, I always try and walk straight on and have my hands showing and make eye contact and get the nod so I can see that someone yeah. um, recognizes me. Yeah. I think that, um, and, and since I, I have been on the Hill, um, since that speech and I did only make that speech because that was the time slotted yeah. to make farewell speeches yeah. so I wasn't sure if I was ever going to get back get that opportunity mm -hmm. come fall because we suspect uh, and the liberals are signaling that they might pull in an election mm -hmm. I wasn't sure if I was ever going to get that opportunity again to be able to share my experience yeah so it was it was really a forced time uh, to have to do that I wish I didn't because it really put the spotlight on me instead of the important work uh, that I'd been I'd been working so hard on and still been trying to do people yeah. have this notion that I've resigned absolutely not my colleague and I Charlie Angus were just doing a press conference last week i'm okay. still here and working so it it's just a matter of how timing worked out as well mm -hmm. absolutely and i the like like you mentioned you're still trying to make a difference within your community and i think that's the most important thing that drove you is is that uh, you know you can help a large group of people um uh, in 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 this kind of way uh, but now we're in a situation where you felt, uh, again, you were quoting saying that Canada's history is stained in blood with a lot of uh, things that happen within Parliament. So leaving Parliament later on in the fall, not right now, you have lots of work to do. What, what, what do you hope is going to happen after you leave? I hope that we get to see a continuation in a sense of what has been able to have been built, which is a sense of transparency, a sense of need for action, a sense of awareness. And I think for a long time, there was that that muzzle. And it's really important for people to know and understand that I would never run with any other party besides NDP. And I'm with NDP for a very, very important reason. That truth and reality has never been able to have come through 
until a representative from the NDP was in that seat. Mm -hmm. And that's something that is, is so important to understand that when we're, we look at politics and politicians, we also look at history. And we also understand that there is the power in, in people in terms of you show up and, and you elect um, individuals, but we've definitely been seeing movements that have been happening. Um, although having to come to horrific circumstances, look at the Black Lives Matter movements that really changed things on international scales in a lot of places. Um, hopefully those kinds of things it doesn't need to escalate that far for Indigenous peoples in Canada. But I think people are coming more to an, a sense of an awareness and um, almost an alarm and the need to, to react to that and to have action to that. I think there's still so much in terms of learning and education for other people to, to do and still very much an awareness that Indigenous people are still very much suffering in terms of a lack of basic human rights, simply because of the where the federal institution, among other institutions like RCMP and churches, had forced Indigenous peoples into, and now systems continue to keep that oppression in place. I think people are starting to connect those dots, but there's still so much connecting, I think, to do. Mm -hmm. And people need to kind of take a breath and, and really look at what's been going on because this was very well, very well planned and continues to be. Absolutely. I, I, want, I want to ask a question, and I, I want to word it correctly, and I don't, I don't want it to be... Um, I'll just I'll just ask it. But but if I let's say I'm your best friend or I'm your cousin and, and I'm sitting beside you and, and you're talking about, you know, uh, you know, pre before you decide you're, you're going to not seek reelection. Uh, if I if I'm sitting beside you like, you know what, uh, Mumalak, keep going, keep fighting. It's 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 so hard in the system. This is a, a colonial building that that uh, you're struggling in. But there's so much work to do and you have such a great platform and I'm saying this because I don't want you to leave and I'm saying that as me as my name is, is Chattis but like in that situation like how 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 do you feel about those people that like just really just don't want you to resign and what what do you plan to do um when you leave office to to still help your people I mean I've basically gotten that talk since there was discussion around an election I'm and sure continue I'm not the first to get one it. To, to um, yeah. And uh, very much the, the question is, will you change your mind kind of thing? <laughs> and uh, unfortunately, no. Yeah. Uh, once I make a decision, I'm very much set in it. Um, there are a number of things that came into play, um, came into deep consideration. As much as I know people have seen me as an inspiration and seen this as a new wave or however way you want to phrase it, it's also been the weirdest, hardest, most insanely difficult time of my life. Mm -hmm. And it looks great from the outside. It looks great from a social media perspective, but I don't live in a social media world. Mm -hmm. And being a politician with this much visibility, 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 excuse me, is a very isolating place to be in. Mm -hmm. I really uh, miss having uh, normal conversations and feeling a sense of being able to do other things that are, are personal uh, mm -hmm. without having to somehow intertwine it within work or intertwine it within something I'm doing within work. Mm -hmm. And I didn't do a great job at separating Mumila and MP. Mm -hmm. And in that, I don't think I can really let those things kind of go anymore. They go kind of hand in hand and that's how people how people view me. And I really, really realized how much I've never had the right to self-determination. Mm -hmm. And that was a really challenging thing for me to come to grips with that I made it this far and made this big of a name or whatever way you want to put it. And it still 
felt like the only reason I was here was because I was surrounded by so much turmoil in my life growing up was I was always in reactive in helping other people survive. Mm -hmm. And if that turmoil wasn't there, if that need for reactive to survive wasn't there, I probably would have pursued zoology or archaeology or fashion or nothing, <laughs> anything <laughs> like this. Yeah. And I feel like I need to go back to like my seven-year-old self and my 17-year-old self and go and find what brings me joy. Of course. And for me, that was like such a hard thing to really come to grips with because there was that that pressure, this idea that, oh, you got to come, you got you to gotta do this because that's the whole 27 years of my life. <laughs> it's yeah. kind of felt like that. Um, and for the first time, I feel like it's time to do something uh, selfish mm -hmm. and and go and figure out um, what brings that uh, joy and happiness and not to say who knows I might go and find that be back in 10 years and have that balance and that feeling of balance in my life because there are definitely things uh, part of this job that I, I do enjoy but it's just not what I want to take on again and I hope that the next um, individual can carry on those truthful and honest conversations, but also, you know, the work in, in terms of things like uh, bringing that awareness to housing, uh, bringing uh, an awareness um, in, in terms of the realities of Nunavut, I hope the the voice continues to say NDP. Absolutely. And I, I think you've, you've done a fantastic job so far, and I'm sure whatever you decide to do, you'll you'll do it with with class and 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 you know what? There's nothing. There's such a bad connotation to um to what's the word? Uh, selfish. And there's nothing wrong with it. There there has like people people can't love you if you don't love yourself. Is what I always tend to tell myself. So finding something selfish to do that brings you joy and passion. You'll you'll. I think we all just become a better human being when we have that in our in our body and in our hearts and. There's nothing wrong with that, so I'm really, I'm really happy you're you're doing something selfish. <laughs> um, we're almost we're almost out of time. I did want to ask you one more thing because I've I've only talked to one or two Inuk people before being down, you know, uh, on the southern part of Canada. Uh, I like to learn about these things, and uh, I don't know a lot about the uh, the facial um, uh, markings on Inuk women. I, f I I think it's a rite of passage thing. I'm not a hundred percent sure. Would would you mind before we go just sharing a bit about uh, the markings on your face? That is the one thing I I don't really touch on. Oh, okay. Um, there's okay. a number of people that would agree or disagree with my perspective. Mm -hmm. um, there's definitely those traditional meanings that are very. Um, symbolic such as reaching uh, womanhood uh, and you will hear different um, markings on different parts of the face for very specific things mm -hmm. um, i have a belief that we can that culture is forever evolving mm -hmm. and that we can in ways um, take what we know is ours yeah. and and create it into who we are and uh, that's usually as far as I go with with my tattoos, and and they're definitely inspired by my um, my dad's Inuk and my mom's Danish, so they're definitely inspired by my my Inuk side. Wow, that's awesome. Well, I appreciate whatever little uh, you want to tell me about it. It's it's really nice to know about it. Uh, Mumilak, I want to thank you so much for your time. I know you still got a busy schedule ahead of you. I know, like you said, it's it's a speech you had to do now, but you got lots of work ahead uh, right up in, uh, until the fall or, or possibly longer. It just depends how uh, elections go. But thank you so much for coming on our native land and being such an inspiration. And uh, we will continue to follow you. Thank you so much. Matna, thank you for having me in this space. I appreciate it. Thank you.